The following was originally presented at the Academy of Doctors of Audiology's Audacity Conference in November 2023. Thank you. I want to open it up with a question. Uh, raise your hand if you're an audiologist or other hearing care professional practicing in a clinical setting. Raise your hand. All right, next question. How many of you have never been frustrated with connectivity issues? <laughs> and that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today because I know both the benefits and the frustrations of connectivity, both from being in the space professionally and being wearing for five years as well. And so I wanna actually start with a little bit on the value of connectivity because it, it is frustrating, but at the same time, I'll, I'll put on my end user hat and just share a few things about what connectivity means to us as clients. So I look at connectivity on personal level, three different scenarios. Uh, think about podcasts and programming and that sort of thing, where you might typically listen with a smart speaker. Well, listening with a smart speaker in a room that might be reverberant, there's noises going around, it can be a lot more difficult to hear. Some of the smart speaker audio quality is not that good. And so it can be a little bit more difficult and less enjoyable to listen in that environment, but a lot of the same programming, virtually all of it, can be streamed directly to your hearing aids. I do this all the time. I'm washing the dishes, you know, I'll fire up a podcast, but I'll stream them directly. And so with a hearing aid, you can also vary the mix. So I can go mostly podcasts and only a little bit reality and all the noise of me washing the dishes, you know, is very down in the background. It's very easy to hear. But if you think about a person also who's living alone, this is a sort of way that they can remain engaged with the world, getting their news programs or sports or podcasts and so on. Same thing with audiobooks. I have a friend, for example, he's in his mid-90s. He's been wearing for 10 or 15 years now. Well, in the last few years, his vision got bad enough that he couldn't read anymore. Well, he was a very avid reader. Well, now what he does is he streams audiobooks. And so he was, He's a smart person and he knew how to get all that set up. You know, the audiologist helped him get set up his hearing aid connectivity, but he knows what he's doing. But this is a sort of thing, not all of your clients are gonna understand this straight away, and yet it's extremely valuable if you can set them up and introduce them to the world of podcasts and audiobooks and so on. So those two together I kind of look at is spoken word audio. Spoken word audio is great through hearing aids because that's what they do. They're meant to make speech more intelligible. It's a little bit different than music. I almost never listen to music through mine because, well, it's not very good. But uh, spoken word audio is brilliant directly streamed through the hearing aids. And the other part is internet meetings. I and mean, a lot of people are doing internet meetings now. and. I know, actually, I've played around with audio quality and internet meetings for a long time. I actually introduced internet meetings into my then company in the late 90s. And back then you didn't have cameras, but you could do PowerPoints on the screen. And in the beginning we would do it with uh, teleconferencing phone and then later, you know, internet. And, and so I learned pretty early on that when we had an internet meeting, you had to make sure you had good audio quality. Because if you couldn't be understood on the other side or you couldn't understand them, the meeting was not going to go well. And I'm going to share more about that because we're all doing it so often now. And I do the same thing. If you look over there, you will see right there next to my smart speaker and my computer is a Roger mic stuck in this little crater. So I actually have two TV connectors, one on the TV, uh, one on our personal workstation, which is downstairs in our home and then in my work office. I uh, use the Roger mic in the cradle as my streaming. And I can go all day with internet meetings without feeling that fatigue because I can hear very well doing it. It's much better than listening to the little notebook computer speakers. And so I want to have a couple of words about each one of these. Spoken word audio, this is actually, I was fascinated to find this out. This is an annual survey that National Public Radio and Edison does. Of course, I'm presenting today in the 2023 version. It's going to be released in a week, so I'm relying on last year's numbers. But you can see how 
spoken word audio is growing. So on average, everybody, 29% of the time, people are listening to something is spoken word audio. And that's the whole gamut. That's, you know, news on uh, streaming news, streaming podcasts, streaming audio books, even across the age groups. The age group you might associate most of your clients with, 55 and up, a third of the time they're listening to spoken word audio. So this is an important part of people's lifestyles. And doing it through mobile devices is becoming popular very rapidly. It's almost taken over actual radios now. So at all age groups, your client base is either listening to spoken word audio in one form or another, will be very shortly, and the way you can add value and, and improve their lifestyles is to make sure they can hear at their best listening to spoken word audio, and that really means streaming. Now, let's talk about internet meetings and working people, because people are working longer, and as you all know, uh, people at all age groups have hearing loss. Okay, yes, there is, it's skewed towards older ages, but if you look at, this is from uh, the CDC, all right, so 5% of working people ages 55 to 64 uh, report being debilitated by their hearing loss. This is self-reported debilitated by their hearing loss. If you add it all up, you get 15% or so. So 15% of working people self-declare themselves as being debilitated by hearing loss, and that can be a real problem for a person's career advancement. If they can't hear well, it's harder to succeed. And this is a great, I, I love showing this study because it illustrates it more than anything. What they did was they took two groups of people, those with hearing loss and those without. And first they made sure they had no other cognitive issues and then they performed a, basically a word recall test. And as a screen, as a control, they actually gave the test visually. And you can see on the bar chart on the left, everybody performed about the same. Now they did it orally and no correction for the hearing loss for people who had hearing loss. And so you, you read words and then after 20 or 30 minutes, you have to recall the words. And you can see the people with hearing loss did about half as well as the people with normal hearing. And then they reversed it. So they delivered corrected audio to the people with hearing loss and they simulated hearing loss for the people who didn't have it and the results are completely reversed. So if you're listening to an internet meeting and you can hear well, you are not capturing and absorbing, you're not remembering what was said, you're going to be disengaged and that is a drag on your career. If you can't engage, you can't remember what was said in the conversation, it's more difficult for you career-wise. And so that makes the connectivity part of participating in internet meetings really important. Because I've tried it with different speaker arrays too, and I, I'm granted I'm an N of one, right? But when you think about it, the direct streaming takes away all the room reverberations and noises, and you're getting fully corrected audio directly to your ears. It's better than trying to listen to the small speakers in whatever room you're in. So I want to, having, having talked about cognitivity and why it's valuable, I want to pivot to Bluetooth. And if there's one takeaway in this whole thing, it's that Bluetooth is a standard that people have to be qualified to. You cannot say you make a Bluetooth earbud unless the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, or SIG, has actually approved your product. They have a rigorous qualification procedure. And so what it means is if your mobile phone has Bluetooth and you buy some earbuds that have Bluetooth, you know they're going to connect to each other. Proprietary systems don't go through this process. And so if you do a proprietary connectivity scheme, you're always at risk on the parts you can't control. So who amongst you who are practicing in a clinical setting have wanted to tear your hair out because all of a sudden everybody's hearing aids became disconnected? Right? I see all the heads going up and down because they're non-standard systems. 
And so the biggest single value in the new Bluetooth system is that it is a standard. Now, we talk about, let's talk about Bluetooth. Don't read all this stuff, okay? I only put it up there to show you how old Bluetooth actually is. Introduced in the late 90s, originally it was a mono system. Remember when people would walk around with those little Bluetooth earpieces for their, you know, for their phones? Or in your car? Later, uh, the Bluetooth SIG was able to stuff a stereo music signal down the pipe. The last major thing that really happened was introducing low energy. That was 10 years ago. You'll hear it called BLE sometimes for Bluetooth low energy. It is, up until now, meant for data. So for example, I go running. Uh, my running watch will uh, send the GPS signal to my mobile phone through the low energy channel. I get out my phone and I want to change modes on my hearing aids. It's the low energy channel that talks to the hearing aids. It was meant for data. It saves a lot of power sending data up the low energy channel, and that's why it's called Bluetooth Low Energy, but it was only for data until the present time. Now the next major thing is coming is to get audio up the low energy channel. Okay, and that's what LE Audio is called. Okay, audio up the low energy channel. And the reason why that's necessary, well, the two things that make Bluetooth difficult for hearing aids today is the power consumption. So I'm wearing Phonax, they do Bluetooth Classic, and if I get carried away with it, it'll drain the batteries. I can use it for limited amounts of time. I can get away with a lot, actually, four or five hours, but I've also run into trouble at the end of a long day if I've been Bluetoothing it too much. And the other is the latency, which is the delay. With Bluetooth Classic, the process of the audio going in, getting compressed to fit the channel, coming back out, getting uncompressed, the delay is rather long. And I'll show a couple of reasons why that's important. But that long delay and the power consumption is what caused all the hearing aid people to develop their own systems. So the whole idea of, of the latest Bluetooth, LE Audio, is to get the power consumption down and to get the delay down. And the hearing aid companies were involved in setting this version of Bluetooth since the beginning. Because the hearing aid companies, people at hearing aid companies that I talk to, aren't really thrilled to have to do proprietary devices. I mean, TV streamers are not really core to what a hearing aid company does. All right? And when I talk to people, they're like, I would rather be done making TV streamers. But they have to do it now because it's the only way. The proprietary systems were the only way to meet the needs of people wearing hearing aids. The new Bluetooth system meets those needs directly. So latency, there's two reasons why you're concerned about latency. One is with lip sync. So if I'm watching television through the TV streamer and looking at the person on the screen, it can't be too out of sync because hearing impaired people are, you know, using lip clues. This is actually an old study that Phonic did, but this is what drove the development of the TV connector that they use. So they did a study with different kinds of television programs and how much delay was tolerable to people. So this is purely lip audio syncing. And you can see that you were good up to 33 milliseconds of delay, and after that, people found it a little disconcerting. Look at that chart. Bluetooth Classic is between 100 and 200 milliseconds delay. So my television has Bluetooth. If I connect these to the television, it's not good. So I use a TV streamer. Now the other part is that when you do a lot of things, it's really a mixed reality experience. And when I watch TV, uh, I've got the, the, the volume on the TV streamer itself set so that I can watch about half and half. So I'm getting half real audio and half streamed audio. And the half streamed audio is enough to improve the clarity so I can hear the television real good, but I can also talk to the other people in the room. And when you do that, latency gets to be even more of an issue. I'm going to play, you're going to hear what it is. You're going to hear sounds at different lengths of delay. 
Here's what zero milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what five milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what 10 milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what 20 milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what 30 milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what 50 milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what 100 milliseconds of latency sounds like. Here's what 300 milliseconds of latency sounds like. It's got to be pretty low or hearing half TV audio and half real audio gets disconcerting in a hurry. And it actually, rather than improving the audibility, it makes it a lot worse. And so the latency has to be pretty low for that reason. Now the other problem with all the proprietary systems is that you just have huge compatibility issues, right? If you're carrying multiple brands of hearing aids, you've got to carry multiple brands of accessories. And it really limits innovation in the accessories. If I, for example, can make the best remote microphone you've ever seen, my only recourse today is to try and sell it to one of the hearing aid companies. I can't just put it on the market and everybody can use it. And they don't play with each other. You know, you might, you might find one company's remote microphone really satisfies your clients, but any of your clients using somebody else's hearing aid can't take advantage of that remote microphone you know is better. And on the consumer device side, you have the same problem. I have an iPhone fine. I got MFI hearing aids. Well, Amazon devices can connect to your hearing aids using ASHA. It doesn't help me if I have MFI hearing aids. So all of the incompatibility with the, with the proprietary systems is making it difficult for you, making it difficult for your clients, and it's impeding innovation. And when I said Bluetooth was a standard that you had to qualify to, well, the systems that are in use today are not standards. And it's no knock on either Apple or Google Android. I mean, they both have really robust organizations working on accessibility and are doing some really interesting things. But the connectivity, as you all know, has always been a problem. And I believe it's because it's a non-core feature of the phone. So in other words, you have uh, the MFI hearing aid connectivity system, you get an operating system update, your phones all start ringing, right? People's hearing aids drop off because they're not thoroughly testing that part of the phone functionality because it's not a core feature of the phone. Standard Bluetooth that you use with your earbuds, that is very core. If they update the operating system and all Bluetooth devices fall off, it's a big problem for them and they'll lose their Bluetooth SIG certification and all the rest. So they actually have to make sure that Bluetooth is not disrupted when they make a change to the phone or the operating system or what have you. And so the biggest thing for you when phones and hearing aids support LE Audio is it's now a standard. Any hearing aid with LE Audio will connect any phone with LE Audio the phone manufacturers will make sure that the Bluetooth system is working properly like they do today. And these sort of kind of connectivity problems that go with the proprietor systems, they go away. So the new Bluetooth system actually has two parts, LE Audio and AuraCast. You can simply think of LE Audio as the next version of Bluetooth and never have to think about it again, really, other than to know that this hearing aid model supports it and these phones support it. So it'll connect just like regular Bluetooth, except the pairing system is going to be a lot easier, so you won't have nearly the problems pairing devices up. It'll be lower power and low enough latency to use with hearing aids. So the new Bluetooth system's pretty nice. And I'm going to talk about how the new Bluetooth system is being rolled out in different devices a little bit further on. The second part is AuraCast. And AuraCast 
is a Bluetooth system broadcast. So normally with Bluetooth, you have to pair one device with another. With the broadcast system, it's just like a radio. So you can have an AuraCast transmission and 10 or 50 or 100 people can tune into it just like a radio station. Unlimited number of users can listen to an AuraCast transmission. That's what's completely new. And the AuraCast transmitters are actually pretty small. So you see, uh, I did the AuraCast demo at the Bluetooth SIG booth at UHA in Germany a couple weeks ago. That little white box is the transmitter. So that little white box could support this entire room. So right now, for example, let's say a year from now, the hotel is doing AuraCast. All they would have to do, back there where the mixer is, our front of house gentleman over there, who's doing a great job, the audio quality has been perfect in all the sessions, he would just simply have like a tripod with that white transmitter, he'd carry it in with the rest of the gear, set it up, take an audio output from the board into the AuraCast transmitter and we're all getting it. So very easy to implement versus a, a hearing loop where you've actually got to go and run the copper loop. Okay. So, that makes it a lot easier to install because you can install it quite easily anywhere. And the interesting thing is, is that it has adjustable latency. So you can actually, at the transmitter side, but also individuals can adjust how much delay. And that's actually pretty important. So audio is slow. Anybody who does anything outside, like boating or running or biking, probably knows this rule. When the thunderstorms are coming, the difference in sound from the thunder to when you see the lightning, or the other way around. You see the lightning and then the thunder comes later, it's about five seconds per mile. So that's how you know how far the thunderstorm is, right? You count the seconds and go, I better get out of here. So if you translate that into kind of room dimensions, if you're sitting, say, three meters, 10 feet away from your television set, the television audio will be 10 milliseconds delayed getting to your ears compared to the visuals. Now 10 milliseconds, so that actually works out in your favor if the audio is 10 milliseconds delayed and your Bluetooth has 20 milliseconds, it said the net is only 10. But you go to a larger setting, meet my wife and daughter, we're at the Andrew Bird concert outside. We are far enough away that there's about 150 milliseconds of delay. You could actually see it. We actually noticed it more when we were at the Bruce Springsteen concert in Wrigley Field because we were sitting, baseball park in Chicago, we're sitting behind home plate, stage and the big screens are in the outfield. And when you watch the big screens, it was a pretty big delay between, say, a drum beat and when you heard it because you were so far away. It was probably a quarter second or maybe a little more. And so you actually have the opposite problem. You actually have to introduce more delay because if you're hearing the live sound of the concert and the stream sound of the concert, the Bluetooth is getting at you at the speed of light instantaneously, but the real sound is coming slowly. So you actually have to be able to introduce more delay into the system. Now you can do that, so for example, if you're in a theater, you can put a transmitter for the balcony and you could introduce the right amount of delay to cover the balcony and then, you know, it, it, people are listening, they get about the right amount of delay. But you can also, the, the Bluetooth applications on the phone will allow you to change the delay. So you can actually just take the slider and go, ah, that sounds perfect. So it's really well suited for larger venues for that reason. Tuning into AuraCast is going to be like tuning a radio. And there are multiple ways of doing it. I saw two of them at UHA. The most common one is actually going to be a mobile phone app, which is these days at least being called the AuraCast Assistant. That serves as your tuner. So you open the app. It tells you all the channels that are available. You pick one. The app tells your earbuds or your hearing aids, whatever you're wearing, to go to that channel. Then the phone is out of the equation. You can actually turn the phone off after that point. It's only serving as the channel selector. Now, you can also do it with a QR code, and I saw this running at UHA too. So imagine you're in a sports bar. Every television set 
has an ORCast transmitter, so you can hear the audio, whatever match you're interested in. You put a placard under the TV that says TV1, TV2, TV3. If you fire up the assistant, you could just select TV1, but you could also walk up and just hit the QR code and it will tune uh, channel one. I think one of the more intriguing ones is the smart earbuds case. JBL has one already. It's not, not Oracast capable, but you can do all your music controls from the case. So you don't even need the phone. You can change the volume and change the track just by grabbing the case and pushing the buttons on the little screen on the case. Well, that's tailor-made for being an Oracast assistant, too. Because you don't need the phone to receive Oracast. You could actually go to a sports bar with the phone at home if you have something like a smart case. Then you can tune the channel with the smart case, put that case back in your pocket, and listen to the match. So there's several different ways of tuning the Oracast channel. Now, these are all still a little bit theoretical. In other words, the system exists, but I haven't seen any production-ready assistance yet. And so that will be a thing. But what I'm going to do right now, you're going to actually get to see uh, a, a demo version of it because Chuck Sabin at the Bluetooth SIG was kind enough to send me the Oracast demo kit that they used at UHA, and I've got it here. So does anybody want to try Oracast? Who wants to do it? All right, come on up. Come on. You okay being on camera? All right, let me, let me get my two audio streams going here. No, no, don't look, don't look. You go over there. <laughs> you are going. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one channel, and one channel is going to be actually me. So kind of the, I'm going to, I'm using this. I had no way to get to the board and put the, put the Oracast streamer on the board. So what I'm doing is I'm using the phone microphone. There's the Oracast, there's the Oracast transmitter right there, pretty small. Uh, now this doesn't have the range to cover the whole auditorium, but it's perfect for demo purposes. So when I talk in here, you're going to hear it, okay? So this one, which is called auditorium, is going to be me. The other one is going to be called TV1, and that's going to be Taylor Swift's Lover Album. <laughs> you get to pick which one you want to listen to. Choose wisely. Go ahead and I clean those ear tips. Pop them in your ears. All right. I brought up the assistant. See, it's just right there, right? So go ahead and hit that. That says Oracast. All right, hit the scan button. It's found the Get a couple of channels. Aerospace Auditorium and TV1, okay? Try one. So we're gonna try the auditorium. All right, so that's me talking. You can hear me, right? You're there. And how's the latency? Do you hear two versions of me or just one version of me? And I'm gonna keep talking so you can hear. There's two versions of you. There's two versions of me. How close are the two versions of me? Um, they're a bit but, apart, but I can still understand it. Yeah, and this is not the most ideal case because there's a little bit of latency in using my phone as a remote microphone. If this were directly into the board, it would be much better. Yeah. But, and he's hearing through his hearing aids too. Sorry? And he's hearing through his hearing aids too, right? Yeah, well, that's why. So, right, he put them there. Yeah, right, so that's why the, the, the virtual me is slightly delayed because of the mobile phone is a remote microphone, right? But it's still pretty good, isn't it? When I tried it, like, it's, it's not... It's not enough delay to impede understanding. And it'd be even better if this were plugged into the board. Well, try the other channel, see what happens. Now I'm joining TV1. There you go. Are you a Swifty? <laughs> right? And you can go back and forth as much as you want. So, you know, you're, you're watching the White Sox play, which. You know, I mean, they lost like 100 games. You know, you get bored with that and you want to watch uh, TV number three instead in the sports bar. You just, you know, whip out your phone and switch to another channel just like that. It switches pretty quick. Yeah, it actually works really good, doesn't it? So there you are. That's actual live Oracast. It exists. Believe it or not, you've been hearing about it for five years. It really works. 
Thank you for playing. And so that's Orcast in the wild. At UHA, they actually had multiple places at Orcast transmitters. So it's real, it's actually coming now. It's actually coming. And I think the important thing is, and this is the part that we don't know yet, or I shouldn't say we don't know, but it's the unfinished business, is you've seen the system, the demo system, but nobody has actually implemented it yet. Phones are capable, last generation or so phones have been capable. I've got a Samsung Galaxy S23 ready to go. Uh, but the assistance haven't been done yet. So there's a lot of work to be done on the user experience part because this has to be made easy for people with all different levels of tech affinity. And the good news is, is that people throughout the hearing health industry have been working with the Bluetooth SIG to develop the system for a long, long time. And so I'm reasonably optimistic we're going to get to a good place with a good user interface that's easy to use, and there'll be different ones, because I could actually write an assistant app and put it on the Google Play Store if I wanted to. There's nothing proprietary about it. So I think you're going to find that being able to operate Oracast and select channels is going to get easier and easier as you know, real assistant apps are introduced. We'll just have to wait and see on that point, but the idea of the whole thing is a standard and anybody can work with it, I think is very much in the favor. There'll be 10 people making assistance, and there'll be assistance for different levels of accessibility. There'll be a lot of different people doing this sort of thing, and I think it's gonna be good. Even the base assistants that come with the phones. You know, even though I'm an Android user, I really respect how Apple makes a seamless experience. And so, you know, when they do an Oracast assistant, whenever they decide to introduce Oracast into AirPods Pros, they'll have an assistant that's really slick and works well and is magical, as they would say. The rollout of Oracast I see happening in three different phases, or there are three different scenarios. Okay, the first scenario is home and personal. And this is the one that's going to happen first. You can already today buy the latest, some of the latest models of Samsung TVs and they'll stream Oracast, production television set. Uh, their latest uh, Buds 2 Pro will receive Oracast. I actually bought a set not long before I came here to try out the Oracast. I haven't got it running yet, but it will do Oracast. So at this very moment, you could actually buy a Samsung TV Samsung earbuds, a GN hearing aid, and you can listen to Oracast in your home. The phones will be doing it too. You can audio share. I haven't said much about this, but on your phone you can audio share. So if I'm listening to some tunes and you want to listen to tunes with me, I could share with you. So two or three or four people can listen to the music streaming out of my phone. So the personal scenarios are already happening. Intel, Intel's latest processors will support LE audio of, of the computer. And they did that work together with Microsoft. So you buy a new machine, Windows 11, latest Intel processor, does LE audio out of the computer. So the personal stuff is already happening. And the, it, you, can, you can envision a time when people stop needing the TV connectors, for example because their computer will do LE audio and they've got an LE audio capable hearing aid or an LE audio capable earbud and that's it. They don't need the proprietary systems anymore. Same with the TV. If you connect with LE audio to the TV, the latency is low enough, you're good to go directly. No accessories needed. The second one I think that will come next is multi-screen venues. And the reason why I think that is if you have a single channel venue, okay? So say like a house of worship. In the US, the house of worship will have a system of some kind, an assisted listening system of some kind. There may be a loop, there may be one of the FM radio systems, like say Listen Tech has, they'll have something. Because they have something, they won't necessarily be so quick to switch to Oracast, especially if they have loop. Right? Why switch right away? I've got a perfectly good working loop. I don't have to switch today. 
But the multi-channel systems are the interesting ones. There are two sports bars in town. One of them installs AuraCast on all their TVs. It's a competitive advantage. So it's really, the spark is almost lit with Samsung now supporting it. And Samsung's got a fairly decent market share, something like 10 or 15% of the true wireless earbuds are Samsung's. Apple is the biggest one with somewhere around 35 or 40% now, rough numbers. And then it kind of tapers off over there. So you get a few of the big companies offering Oracast earbuds, it starts to be worth it for the sports bar to install it on their television sets and advertise the fact that they have it. Same thing with like, uh, you know, health clubs, for example, where you've got the array of TVs, right? So I think that's going to be second. The multi-screen's going to be second. And then the single venues, I think, will be last. There'll be some progressive ones who go for it, but if you have a system in place, you can use that system for a while. And I think that's actually uh, a conversation worth having about how you support hearing loops for people because the fact that Oracast is rolling out, I would not hesitate to say that you're still going to be supporting T-coils for a long, long time. Okay. It's going to take a long time before Oracast overtakes loops. I think, I'm guessing it's going to be like 10 years. And now the heartening thing is, is that both GN uh, and Signia, whose device uh, has Oracast capability, but they're going to do a software update a little later, they're both supporting models with Oracast and loops together, or T-coils together. And so this is where I would say for a person living today, part of their lifestyle, they need T-coils for the things they like to do keep talking about T-coils with them. There's actually even a sheet of paper in the swag bag that's resources on how to support uh, telecoils for your clients. So I recommend looking at that. And the nice thing is actually most of what's in there will apply to Oracast too. So for example, they talk about how you, know, you can use a, 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 one of the personal coils uh, to demonstrate T-coil functionality and uh, you know, do a, a T-coil operation check with the real air system. Well, you'll be able to do all that with Oracast too. So you could get one of these tiny Oracast transmitters and do the same thing. So the resources on that sheet of paper, I think, are good for today, and they'll be good in whatever version of the foggy future or Oracast more or less takes over. I want to share this slide from Intel because it shows where all this is going. Uh, so there was about a month ago now, a two-day innovation summit that Intel did. And the keynote speaker, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO, talked about how they're taking connectivity with Intel computers and what they're doing with it. And so it, I'm actually going to play a little bit of the clip of his keynote. It's queued up to start at the connectivity part of it. And, but they've already, they're now already working with you know, the hearing aid companies to make sure everybody's good with the LA audio. At the GN booth at UHA, they actually had a notebook computer running with a hearing aid connection to it. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to play the video. You know, as you saw with Rewind, leveraging core ultra and open vino and transforming lives and improving accessibility, but until recently, PCs couldn't connect to hearing aids like mine because the traditional Bluetooth simply used too much power. Well, recently, Bluetooth low energy audio that we've worked on uh, with Microsoft is first coming and available uh, since uh, earlier this year and part of the uh, Core Ultra platform. And we've been collaborating with Starkey Labs, and these hearing aids are right like the ones that I'm uh, wearing here, you know, to create a POC for how AI can improve the hearing aid experience. So we're going to join a call here with Arnaud on my Sa uh, Samsung Galaxy book. So Arnaud, how are you? Hello, Pat. I trust your keynote is going well. Yeah, well, I, 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 I trust you're keeping track of all the great things I have to say, Arno. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching from backstage. So now your PC is contextually aware and will automatically switch your hearing aid between ambient aware and focus uh -huh. mode by adjusting the sound amplification. You can stain your flow without missing any important information. 
okay? So when I can uh, go up here and I can switch from focus mode you know, to ambient mode, and now I can hear the other things going on, and uh, in focus mode, it's just you and I, Arna. Yes, Pat. We won't amplify the background noise so you can concentrate on our conversation. But we'll make sure you don't miss any important interruption, such if a delivery arrives. Uh, well, okay. Maybe the grandkids are at the door. Hopefully my wife gets it, so we'll dismiss that there. So, uh, you know, stay focused just on you and I, but the PC yes. is still detecting. Yeah, your PC recognized the delivery and alerted you, but you choose to ignore it, and the PC decided to keep the hearing aids in focus mode. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, okay, well... Uh, Okay, I, I think I'm going to go talk to uh, who's ever here. Just a second, hey. Arno. Sure. Hey, hey. Diana. Hey, Pat. What's up? Why are you interrupting my demo? Do I need a reason? I, it's always a good time to talk to me. Oh, th I'm so, sorry. Thank I'm you. sorry. Thank for, you for taking me, the Diana. interruption. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for taking the interruption. And actually, I think I might have wasted my time waving because I think your computer actually heard the sound of me saying, excuse me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it even told you which direction that sound was coming from. So I used wasted a lot of energy, but I'm so glad you came over. Thank and you. And I think you've got a really great, great system over there. It sounds like with the head tracking AI, there, it actually detected when you left the conference call. And so your hearing aids were automatically switched to ambient mode so we could chat. Mm -hmm. And then when you go back, it's going, to, it's going to automatically switch your hearing aids back to focus mode so you can be focused again on talking to Arno. So pretty, pretty cool technology there. Very nice. Tracking AI is actually running on the MPU in the Intel Core Ultra. And another thing we have running on the NPU is the summer, an AI summarization technology. So it's actually, as you're talking to me, it's over there, busily so, summarizing so and condensing. So are those still... Yeah, so I mean, that, that's enough to give you an idea what they're, what they're working on with the PC and the hearing aid connection. It's pretty cool, actually, isn't it? And this was, this was actually showing it uh, at the GN booth. So you've got the hearing aids paired. You could actually change the modes of the hearing aid from the computer if you wanted to. You can see the battery levels uh, of the hearing aids as well. So that's actually running on a production notebook computer now. And all the different places where Auracast can add real benefit, and actually for everybody, I think that's ultimately uh, the good thing about having a standard Bluetooth system. All of these places, everybody can use it. Hearing loops today for hearing impaired people wearing hearing devices. Auracast is for everyone. So anybody with an earbud can get the audio from a sports bar or a museum or uh, there are some cities who have put uh, loops in the train cars. Uh, very easy to put Auracast in a train car so you can, you know, you can wear your noise canceling earbuds and still hear the station stops. So since everybody can use it, it's going to spur installations faster than ever would be done with loops. Right? The competitive advantage of the first sports bar in town to install Auracast. And all of these different places can make use of it. And so, although we're right, right at the very beginning, I laid eyes on the actual production or a cash transmitter, the one I showed you earlier two weeks ago. It's all coming together now. You have the consumer, the mass market consumer devices using LA Audio and Oracast. You now have two hearing aid brands doing it. There'll be more coming. You've got one major market earbud company already doing it, more coming. So it's all going to happen, and there's value in being able to stream the audio in all these different venues. And so what's good for the mass market is good for people who wear hearing devices, because people who wear hearing devices are going to get this experience in many, many more places. Now, I actually, this was the Bluetooth demo at Yuha, so they had two TVs on the wall simulating the sports bar. That white thing on the, towards the left is a transmitter. But I actually want to leave you with, I shot some video, interviewed Chuck Sabin, and that's going to be, that will come out as soon as I can edit all the video. But he said something which I thought was really interesting because I told him how I thought the rollout would come in three phases, and he offered a different take on it, which I think 
is really interesting to hear, so I'm going to play that piece of the video so for you. So when I think of it, tell me if, if you agree or if you disagree and why, but I think the next application will actually be the multiple TV application, because hearing loops can't operate in sports bars, right? Mm -hmm. Single channel per. Correct. Plus, it's mass market. In other words, if there are three sports bars in town, and I own one of them, right. the minute there are enough ordinary true wireless earbuds doing AuraCast, I may install them to get a competitive disadvantage right. over the other two sports bars in town, whereas an auditorium that has an FM system or a loop installed, they're not necessarily in a rush because they're already providing that service and they can wait a little longer before installing yet another one. Is that, is that how you see it playing it's out? A, that's, yes, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a good example of how this all, uh, this all might work out, where you know, places that have, uh, when we talked about your Unmute Your World, places where you have multiple screens or multiple channels of, of application or, or, or availability of audio, uh, Oracast is is perfect for that. I do want to challenge one aspect associated sure. with like theaters and uh, um, you know plays and so on. Um, even within the loop system, which might be a single channel, you might get just the the the, the audio from on stage. We've heard from a number of of people in a number of these installations that are looking at different types of audio that people might want to have. Some of it might be just I need dialogue enhancement. So there's general audio. Oh. There's dialogue enhancement, and then there's also a place for people who don't have sight that want actually audio description as a part of their experience at that theater. So they can hear fine, they can hear what's happening on stage, but they can't see what's happening on stage. So now, even within those theaters and so on, they can provide multiple different types of accessibility to the individual based on what their actual that need is. That is super interesting. I'd never heard it described that way before, but that is really, really interesting. Yeah, so this is really, to me, this is really about overall accessibility. It's not accessibility for one group of people. It's accessibility options for a large group of people, whether or not it's just the general consuming public or other people that have other types of accessibility challenges that need to be addressed through an audio experience. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. I really love that. I want to leave you with that because this is what makes this new system so exciting because you can start to think about accessibility in different ways when you can stream, for example, three different versions of the audio in a live theater. And so, ultimately, I think the game is really changing now that the frustrations that come with connectivity today are going to fade as this system gets rolled out because it's a standard system that everybody will, it'll be totally interoperable and much easier to implement. And with all the deployments that are going to come in the years ahead, it's gonna be a real game changer for the lifestyles of people more so than just people with hearing loss, so that's what we're talking about here. But generally, accessible audio in so many more public places, I think actually when we look back on this 10 years from now, it's going to be amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew. I feel like this is such a question. No, you're welcome. And we've got 15 minutes. If anybody else wants to try the demo, come on up.